and other stuff. And the third, we also have education. Right? So those are very important, uh, important indicators to understand what the economic development means. Right? And then, so in this chapter, so what we're going to do, or in today's lecture, what we're going to do, so we are going to look at economic growth. We start with economic growth. It is obvious because economic growth is necessary. It's the first step for us to understand economic development, even though it is not everything about economic development, but that's the first thing. Right? We are going to study concepts and the patterns regarding the economic growth. Okay? And then so we are going to have four topics in this chapter or in tonight's discussion. Number one, we are going to look at divergent patterns of economic growth since 1960. Right? So and then so we are going to look at characteristics of rapidly growing country so that we can understand how they are similar or what is uh, what is behind their successful story. And then we are going to look at a simple accounting. Right? So this is called growth accounting. Right? And then we do two steps. First, we look at factor accumulation. Essentially, we look at a simple production function. Okay? And then so we are doing a accounting analysis so that we understand the source of, economic, uh, source of growth analysis. After this chapter, we are going to move to next one. In the next chapter, what are we going to study? We are going to study the economic growth theory, or in other words, after this chapter, we are going to understand, oh, so if you observe a region, a economy, a country has experiencing some growth, right? And then so we can uh, decompose the source of the growth. As you're going to see later, essentially, it's going to follow, follow three um, aspects. Either there's capital growth, or if there's a labor growth, or if there's a technology. Right? Either way. Right? But, but toward the end of this, this chapter, we only understand, or the only thing we can achieve is, so it, we just decompose the growth we observe into one of the three factors. But if we do not have a theory to explain why, you, why those things can contribute towards the growth. Right? So this is only a mechanical, engineer, uh, mechanical accounting. But then in the next, next uh, chapter, I'm going to offer you different economic theory that explains so why those things can help to generate economic growth. So that's the big picture of this chapter. And also, this is a big picture of what we are going, um, going to understand economic development. And certainly, after we understand economic growth, and then so we are going to add layers of a layer of things that help us understand economic development including, say for example, income inequality, say for example, human uh, development, including um, health, including education, so on and so forth, right? So those are, those, those are aspects for us to understand economic development. Also, those are things we need to understand uh, during the process of economic development, but that's the next step, right? First, let's understand economic growth. That's what we are gonna to do today, right? Toward the end of today's class, just if I forgot, please remind me. So we need to discuss two things. One, I'm going to quickly go, uh, walk you through the homework, the homework one. So homework one has, uh, has many things to do with today's lecture. And secondly, so we need to discuss or we start to prepare in the group presentation. We need to figure out a way how we can form, um, how we can form a groups through, um, say, you know, either Zoom or through um, Google Doc, right? So if I forgot, please remind me. So, so, that's, so those are the two things uh, we want to discuss toward the end of today, right? So now let's back to our business, economic growth. First, let's look at divergent pattern of economic growth since 1960. So 1960 is not a magic number. 1960 pretty much is referred to after World War II, after the recovery from the war, right? And then so we start to see some growth. Now we are going to see so how the growth pattern differ, okay? And from those uh, diverging growth patterns, so hopefully you can find some clues what contribute to a successful growth story, right? 
So first of all, after 1960, less developed country, LDC stands for less developed country, begin to diverge. Okay, here are example. Per capita income in Thailand. Okay, remember, so we always use per capita, right? If you look at aggregate, it doesn't help us much because in aggregate level, you have high income, but then this is going to offset by high population. Okay? Per capita income in Thailand was 1100 and that of Zambia was 1200. It seems like Zambia is doing better compared with Thailand. But now what happens? So this is probably is, um, uh, the data a few years ago. If you're interested in, you can just look at um, different data source to find out the updated number. I would suspect uh, the, the number, the gap between Thailand and Zambia is even wider. Okay? Now given this number I have, so Thailand has a per capita income of 7,000 US dollars, but Zambia is about 900. Okay? So you can see it, they started with similar, but now so their gap is close to eight times difference. Okay? What happened? It happens if we look at the simple algebra or simple numbers, it, because the growth number is different. By Thailand, so the growth over 4.5% per year, and the Zambia growth was negative, right? So of course, that explains why they decreased from 1,200 to 900. The growth rate was 0.9, uh, 0 0.6, and a negative 0.6% per, per year. That's Zambia, right? The small number translate into big difference. Here I want to remind you a rule of 70. So in economic growth, we have a rule of 70, but this is coming from simple math. Essentially it says if a country grow at X percent per year, okay, it's going to take 70 divided by X year to double their income. In the case of Thailand, 70 divided by 4.5, less than two decades, Right, so in less than two decades, Thailand, so their income is going to double, right? On the other hand, Zambia, so the growth rate is negative. You can see, so the country is going to collapse, right? For students who are interested in, so you should find out where does the rule of 70 comes from. But basically, this rule of 70 comes from, I mean, just, I give you some hint, log of one plus x is close to x. All right, so that's the only hint I want to give you so you can work out your math yourself. But if, if, if you are not really into this math, just keep in mind 70 rule, rule of 70, right? So if a country grow by X percent, it's going to take 70 divided by X years to double its income. Okay? So this is the first uh, example, show you there is a divergent growth experience since 1970. So we just look at two countries, Zambia versus uh, Thailand, right? Now we can look at a broader set of countries. Right? So from 1960 to 2003, so this should hold true across um, a wider range of countries. So you have some country experienced negative growth, including Nigeria, Zambia. So the example we just look at, Chad, right? So they have a growth rate of a negative, less than zero. And then so we have some slow growth country. Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, Argentina. The growth rate is close to 1% or even below. So the second group, the second group. Now, so we have moderate growth, Lesotho, Egypt, Brazil, India. Right? So their growth rates is moderate. And interestingly, so this growth rate, this rent around 2%, this is the growth rate most advanced the economy, say we give them OECD country, they experience. So OECD stands for Organization of Economic Co Cooperation and Development. Essentially, is a club of rich countries, including United States and most Western European countries. Right? For those countries, sometimes we could advance and we also call them mature economy. Okay? And then their growth rate is fairly stable, but also moderate. Okay? And actually, so in the next chapter, we are going to have a theory to understand why those countries typically they have a moderate growth. All right. So now go to the next group. 
So we have rapid growth country, including Botswana, Malaysia, South Korea, Singapore. And then we may want to expand this, um, uh, this, uh, this, this group of country by including China, has high, high growth. And then you may want also want to include uh, Japan for a certain time period. Okay, for a certain time period, because unfortunately Japan is here, right? Uh, and then so you may also want to uh, consider Taiwan. Okay, and Wales, right, Hong Kong as a region. So the growth rate was very, very rapid, right? So range between 3.3 .3 to uh, 6.3. So those are rapid growth countries. Now lastly, so we have industrial countries, right? So these include Japan, United States, Canada, UK. So their growth rate is moderate. So I already mentioned that here, right? So but just please differentiate these two groups. Moderate growth, moderate growth country. So they not they include some industrial country and many other less developed country, right? But industrial country typically their growth rate were moderate, right? Okay, so in United States is a leading example, right? So that just give you a sense how the growth experience look like, right? Okay. Just remind yourself, rule of 70, 70 divided by X, right? If a country grow by 7% per year, like a Chinese economy did since 1980, it means it's gonna take a decade for them to double their income. Three decades is going to increase by eight times. But now look at Japan, oh, sorry, look at United States. So during the past century or the 20th century, United States, experience the growth rate close to 2% for 100 years. What that means? That just means it takes 35 years to double income. Meaning in a century, so the, the United States, the economy is going to grow, is going to grow eight fold. Right? Because one, 100 years is one century. So there are roughly three, 30, 35 years in one century. Every 35 years, the US economy is going to double. Then they are going to double three times and the way they're going to grow eightfold. Right? Now look at a high growth country. If a country grows 7% per year, they are going to double their income in 10 years. Meaning in order to re, uh, achieve the same growth, which is eight fold as US economy experience in the 20th century. Okay, for this country, it's gonna take three decades. So that's the power of growth. Now, but later we, we want to see, we want to understand what can contribute to such difference, like 7% versus 2%. All right, for now, let's just look at the ex their experience and they're trying to find some similarities. Okay, now here, just to summarize their similarities among rapidly growing country. Okay, the key word is rapidly growing. We want to find out their key, their key to success, their key to growing rapidly. Okay, so there are five characteristics or there are five common features among those rapidly growing countries. So those are the five things that is going to be the key to understand why those countries grow fast. Now in the following slides, I'm going to go one by one with you. Start with macroeconomic stability. Okay. So what does macroeconomic stability mean? So macroeconomic stability, in order to understand that stability, we first need to understand what characterizes macroeconomy. Right? So in principle of macroeconomics, we learn there are a few things that are important to understand macroeconomy or to understand the health of the macroeconomy. So if you give them price level, okay? Let me write down price level. 
Okay? And actually, you see here, is referred by the first bullet point. So those countries, they achieve macroeconomic stability by avoiding inflation and recession. So inflation refers to price level, meaning so their government, more specifically central bank, they have a stable policy. They trying to contain the inflation. You may wondering, so how difficult it, it, it is to avoid inflation. So then here I need to take a, a sh short detour to help you understand what is inflation. So inflation in plain language essentially is a central bank or the government, if you like to call because typically so central bank belongs to the government or they are closely related in some sense, right? So the inflation happens when central bank print out a lot of money, right? And then so you have lots of uh, money to to go after the certain amount of goods and service and then so we have rising price level and then so we have inflation but then think about what is the cause of print those money in modern days the cause of printing money is very low essentially you just print out the papers right so it's, it's low but then so what's the benefit the benefit is so in some sense the central bank and eventual treasure or the government, they generate revenue. They can use the printed papers, which we call money, to pay government spending, right? So in that sense, pretty much every government has incentive to run inflation. But then, so why we need to avoid inflation? Or why it can cause damage to the economy if there's high inflation? This is because if the country has high inflation, Let's look at this example, right? So there's Zaire or Cong Congo. So they have a high inflation rate of uh, 2,800%, okay? And what, what does that mean to the citizen or to investor? Essentially, if there's high inflation, meaning so you're going to lose money down the road, right? So you do not want to hold cash, right? And you do not want to, to invest, right? So if there's no investment, if there's very little transaction, and then so that's going to hurt economic growth. So that's why we want to avoid inflation. But uh, certainly there is a trade-off. And certainly there's a temptation for the government, right? As I just explained to you minutes ago, so the government has temptation to use inflation as a cheap way to finance government spending. Okay? But then so those successful countries they did that by holding their temptation, but resist the temptation, okay, and avoid inflation so that they provide a stable price level for investors, for households to do their private business. This is the first. Now, how they are going to avoid recession? So the uh, recession, yes, later we are going to explain, so where does recession comes, right? But for now, let me just, I only want to emphasize to avoid recession or to um, reduce the damage of the recession. The government has plenty of things to, to do, right? So if you get the recession hits, the government can provide some accommodative physical policy, meaning they reduce tax, they provide subsidy. Or at the same time, the central bank can carry out accommodative monetary policy. Say, for example, to provide liquidity. Say, for example, to provide cheap credit, right? So in that sense, so we can avoid the huge damage of the recession, and then so we can smooth out damage, and we can preserve the economic growth we have accumulated before, All right? So this is the first thing in terms of macroeconomic stability. The other one is political stability or political instability. So if a country experiences political instability in the form of civil war, military coups, or cross-border wars, right? so actually they are rampant in Africa and in Latin America. Right? If that's the case, that's going to discourage investment. 
first and foremost, foreigners do not want to invest. Now they, because they will, they will be, the investor will be scared away. For domestic households or domestic investor, they do not, they do not want to invest, or they are not there to invest, because they do not know when, in what form, their investment will go away. Instead, they may just hold in cash, or they may just divert their resources to some more stable economy. Like in the international financial market, American Treasury or United States Treasury is considered a safe, um, safe asset. Now, and then they may invest in U.S. stock market or invest in U.S. treasury market. Right? So the political instability is going to hurt long-run growth. Or in other words, political stability provide the support to economic growth. This is the first aspect. All right. Any question? All right. Now here Eric, we have yes. I have one question just about um, inflation. Um, what's the norm rate on developing countries? Are they are they usually usually using like the US dollar or is it more the norm for the for the other currency? So I apologize. Can you say it again? So your your voice kind of cut off. Oh, sorry. Just asking for like um, developing countries. Is it the norm for them to use a more stable currency like the U.S. dollar, or do they usually have their own currency? Oh, so that's a that is a good question. So to to answer your question, so and then so we need, in some sense, we need to take a big detour. Okay, so in international finance or international economics there is a, there is a, a theory called trilemma the trilemma says i mean for a central bank or for a government or for a country in terms of a, a monetary policy so they have three goals number one their independence meaning so they independent of the foreign interference and the number two, the stability of exchange rate. And I believe the third one is the stability of inflation. Right? And so the trilemma says you can only uh, achieve two of them. Okay, and why I mentioned these, uh, these things to answer your questions, let me just repeat your question to the rest of the students. So this student ask, so there are some developing country or poor country in Africa or Latin America, and they use US dollar as their currency, right? And I'm trying to say, yes, it's going to be a good option for some countries, right? So that they can uh, provide stability, so that they have um, a smooth and a stable monetary policy because essentially they just follow the lead of the United States. And over time, US government, particularly the central bank, is very, um, very robust and very responsible. It sounds like a good idea. But however, you lose your independence in the following sense. So if a country use foreign currency, like, like in this case, use US dollar as their circulation, and then they lose two things. Number one, they lose the ability to use inflation to finance government spending, right? Because you cannot just print out money to pay for your government spending. Yes, I mentioned so to do that is dangerous, is, is, is harmful. But if you just use moderate inflation, you use, um, you use uh, control, uh, controlled money printing to pay your spending is a good thing. It's a uh, cheap financing. You lose that. And then number two, so if you use US uh, um, dollar as your currency, right? And then just think about it. So the local business, how they are going to borrow, right? So they may subject to uh, the regulation or subject to the control of foreign company or foreign country. So those are the costs you have to pay if you decide to use a foreign currency, typically US dollar, 
as a circula as a circulation currency. Yes, to summarize, yes, there is a upside, but you lose certain ability to um, help your economy. Does that help you to understand the issue? Yep, thank you. Okay, so now we move to the, okay, yeah, so there are a few slides to support um, the idea of macro stability. Um, so here's, uh, yes. I, I just have one more question, if that's all right. Yes, of, of course, absolutely, yes. Yeah, so when you're looking at inflation, right, so theoretically speaking, if a country isn't experiencing any type of instability, like uh, you mentioned Zimbabwe, right, and its currency yeah. is strongly backed in some way, whether by global trade power or by material like gold, would there be any consequences if that country prints more and more money? Um, and my, like, my question is coming from looking at uh, our country, the United States, which has rapidly increased the national debt over the past 20 or so years, but has seemingly avoided the problems of rising inflation. Okay, so that is an excellent question. This is a question uh, makes uh, oh, pretty much every uh, macroeconomist scratch their head, right? Here, so I can only offer you in some sense, quote unquote, superficial answer, right? And uh, so US, so your concern is legitimate, right? For a, uh, for a typical country, so if, they're, if they do what American government did, they are going to run into trouble. And then so why uh, US government can, can do what they do? So there is a one, uh, one sense you want to pay special attention which is US dollar is considered as a global currency. So in, in some sense, you like it or not, in some sense, so United States is kind of take advantage of the rest of the world. But apparently to answer your question, it's gonna be more subtle, more complicated. But that definitely play a role. What that means is, so you, United States, they can keep printing money, keep borrowing, and then the rest of the world, they are going to, I don't like the word, but in reality it is, they suck it up. So they have to buy, they have to hold in a US dollar. Why they want to buy US treasure? It because even though US economy may have trouble, uh, may have trouble down the road, but it still is better than the rest of the world. And then so for the investor, they must pick the uh, pick between words, Worst and the worst. Oh, like the lesser of two evils when picking a currency to invest in. Right. That, that's right. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, this uh, this is one one aspect you want you want to keep in mind. Does that does that make sense to you? Is that you, you get my point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that. Okay, but this is uh, this is one uh, aspect. But the other thing is, uh, so. They just look at international perspective, right? So you understand that. So basically, so the rest of the world, uh, so they they have to find a place to 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 sit there to to what to, uh, to um to put their money, and then they find that U.S. Uh, market is even though they have trouble down the road, and still, so this is a good option, right? So this is number one. This is international perspective. And plus, okay, so there are so many countries rely on U.S. dollar to do their international transaction. So they really they cannot they can they cannot afford, uh, avoid such things. This is international aspect. Now we go to domestic um, um, domestic affair. And uh, so unfortunately, so this debt issue has a lot of politics um, uh, get involved, right? And particularly, we are in the year of election, right? And then, so typically, the um, uh, um, politicians they like to use debt to do some of their to achieve some of the goal. And why is that? And the secret lies in the difference between debt financing versus tax financing. So, what is the difference? If we want to finance a government spending, say, for example, the CARES Act, right? So, I'm not sure everybody knows that. CARES Act is the act we recently passed to fight the coronavirus. It stands for uh, Corona Act. 
uh, and recovery, so, sorry, I forgot. So CARES Act, C-A-R-E-S. But anyway, so it's a, it's a law passed to fight the um, Corona virus or the crisis, right? And right, so say for example, the government has it seems to do, or you can think about if there's a war, either way, right? And what is what is the data financing? So basically, the government borrow, as you just mentioned. So they print uh, treasures, right? And then the treasures either purchased by Central Bank, which is Federal Reserve Bank, or purchased by Japanese government or Ch Chinese government or whoever, right? And and then so temporarily, there's no further issue or further burden on the local, on the domestic economy. Because essentially they borrow money from somebody and then they, they use the borrowed money to pay for their bills. And then their bill is going to uh, make their voter happy, right? So this is one option they have. What is the other option? The other option is, okay, so I'm going to tax. Okay, why tax can solve the problem? Because tax can generate tax revenue. Think about uh, you either increase income tax or you charge consumption tax. And then with the tax revenue, and then you can pay for the bill. Now, the voter is not going to like. It. Why is that? Nobody likes tax, right? Now, you clearly see the difference between tax financing and the debt financing, right? But there's a reason why I talk about politics and a reason why I talk about this like a domestic, uh, uh, domestic issue. And the reason why I bring this to your attention to your original question, it seems like I took a long detour, but actually it's not, right? So uh, you borrow, right, in the short term, it seems like this is a good option, particularly for politicians, particularly for the uh, income and the government. But ask yourself, how we are going to pay off those debt? So this debt, this, those debt must pay off by the future generation. Then then so how they're gonna pay off the debt. And then so eventually they must pay higher tax for the future generation, right? But then so currently, so there are two arguments against such discussion or two arguments says, okay, so we can ignore this discussion. Number one, so right now the, the, the issue is too urgent or it's better we postpone the discussion. We must also write. So that's why they just keep um, issuing that and then so leave the discussion in the future, this is number one. And then number two, so I think many economists were hoping, oh, so if we can solve the puzzle right now, and then so we avoid big recession, and then so hopefully we can achieve better or higher economic growth, we make our economic pie bigger. And then, so in that sense, that's, we are going to reduce our tax burden in the future. So that's the story. So basically I, take, I, I took, a, I took a, a big detour to answer your question through international perspective and through domestic issue, through the lens of domestic issue. But uh, um, to summarize, uh, it is a legitimate and a serious concern but it seems like we do not have a better solution. That's all I can say. The, did I answer your concern or your question? Yeah, yeah, you definitely did. Um, uh, I, I felt like it was, I mean, just looking at our country, I felt like um, most politicians specifically, you know, no matter which party uh, they're a part of, whether Republican or Democrat, aren't very concerned about the debt. And I just kind of wanted to get some insight from an international economics perspective on, I guess, why that was the case. And uh, exactly. you did a great job. Right. And then so here's so I, want, uh, um, uh, I want to add a further comment, in, uh, in particular in international um, aspect. Right? So here we can think about China. And China has what they call the, um, uh, what's called road, Build and Road Initiative. I'm not sure any of you heard about Build and Road Initiative. Anyone? I believe that's called, that's how they call it. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So in some sense, people compare this with Marshall Plan. Right? So they have lots of diff, uh, they have lots of uh, difference, but they also have lots of uh, similarity. And here I want to 
look at this issue through a simple perspective or link to your question or particular link to our class, right? So whether it is a build and road initiative or the Marshall Plan, essentially in some sense in a crude way, is a superpower or a country won't have some international influence through their, uh, with, uh, on their allies or on their potential allies. And, and then the way they do is they offer art. Okay, this doesn't, this just stands for, sorry, I should use different words to avoid confusion. Right, so essentially they just offer some financial support. Right, through a example, grant, through a foreign developed investment, or more specifically, like in this case, through debt. Right? And that those things can, can create some future trouble, right? And so we, we will have one chapter to look at this, this issue down the road. Think about like a, a fi, uh, foreign developed uh, develop investment, All right? Okay, so I guess we better to move on because um, I have expanded by probably like 10 minutes to answer your question. Um, um, but I, but I, but I'm happy that if, if, if that answers your question, I would be happy. Otherwise, so probably it's, it's a waste of your time. Yeah, yeah, it, de it definitely did. I appreciate it. Definitely, it definitely, okay, pretty good. Okay, so now back to our business, right? So we mentioned macro, macro stability. And that, so here, so we just look at the actual economy, look at inflation versus uh, growth. So inflation versus growth. You, we run a simple, basically we run a simple regression, right? And here, so we just put the dot, put the, put the observations here, right? So we have so many observations. We have, so each dot represents one country and one year, right? And the horizontal line is the inflation. And the vertical line, vertical line is uh, GDP uh, per capita growth or per capita GDP growth. And from here, you can clearly see there's a negative correlation, meaning higher inflation, lower growth, right? So you can see the pattern. Okay. All right, so now we go to next slide. Mm -hmm. Does it give me trouble? It's... All right, so now what do we have here? So here we look at GDP per capita before and after civil war, right? So we talk about the other aspect of stability, which is political stability or political instability, right? And this is uh, clear. This is, a, this is true across the board. For any single country we have seen here, so their per capita GDP decline after civil war, right? So just due to the reason I explained to you earlier. And if you look at those countries, you can see so most of them are in either in Africa or in Latin America, like including Peru and El Salvador. Right. Okay, very good. So now we go to the second characteristics or second common features among those high growing countries. Investment in education and health. Okay. Number one, investment on human capital is a key and why human capital is so important and why we want to have a good investment in human capital this is because human capital is going to translate to longer life oh by the way so human capital is just related to better health uh, higher education and a more productive workers right so if we have good investment in human on human capital that's going to translate, it, it translate into longer life expectancy. So if we have longer uh, life expectancy, and then so our worker can work longer, right? Just, just remind you, in 1950, the uh, worldwide life expectancy is less than 50 years. Even though you work to all your, your death, and then so your working uh, year is around 30 years, right? Because probably you, you start to work at 20 and then to work to the death, which gives you 30 years to work. 
Now, in, and currently, so worldwide, the uh, life, expect, life expectancy is around 70 years. But yes, so this number varies from country to country. So for example, United States, the life expectancy for male is about 76, and the female is slightly longer, right? But uh, this longer life expectancy allows you to work for longer time period. And then so the society as, as a group, they can produce more, right? And, and the second thing, so healthier. If you're healthier, and then you can become more productive. Just think about, uh, or just remind yourself, sick leave. Right? So if you are not healthy, and then so you probably take a lot of sick leave, or just think about if you got a cold, that's a mild uh, health problem, your productivity is going to decline. So myself, I have a research, uh, I find out, look at US data, a healthy person, lifetime earning can be 30 times higher compared to a unhealthy person. Now this is the United States. Lastly, so you have productive population. So that is meaning so your worker, your typical worker, healthier, uh, live longer, uh, has better skill, and has um, better knowledge. Okay, so this is why we want to have good investment on human capital. Okay. And then second, is health and education are both input and means and outcomes of development. What this means is, so on the one hand, we have health and education or or the uh, workers or a population has good health and a good education. So that's going to lead to economic development. On the other hand, economic development is going to provide you with good health and better education. So, so good health education, they are the cause of development. At the same time, it's a consequence of development. So it is a cause of development. It probably is easier to understand. So it is a consequence of development. It's because uh, you have development, then you can afford to provide your citizen with good health and education. On top of that, so with, with development, and then the society has a mindset, or has a culture, or has a norm to provide good health and better education to their citizen. Right? And last, the increase in level and quality of education and health is crucial. Right? Not only the quantity, but more, what matters is, is uh, qual uh, quality. All right, so this is the second aspect. Now let's see some figures, or let's look at actual data, okay? So here, this data just show you life expectancy at birth. Life expectancy at birth, right? And then on the vertical lines, you have a GDP per capita growth. Okay? And they are correlated. Now, just keep in mind, so this correlation not necessarily tells you the causality. And so the increase in life expectancy can be a cause for GDP per capita growth. It can also be a consequence. Just follow the discussion I just had in previous slides. All right. So next one, this is the third common features, effective governance and institutions. Right? Here I want to uh, mention an uh, um, economist. So Douglas North, he won Nobel Prize back in 19, 1990s. So Douglas North studies the relationship between economic growth and institution. And this institution includes the following rule of laws, extent of corruption, property rights, and the quantity of government bureaucracy, bureaucracy, and other measures of institutional quality. Or in other words, so his theory, his study can summarized by this equation. Economic growth as a dependent variable, and the institutions, so again, so this institutions is a multi-dimensional aspect. 
as a function of institutions. And he thinks those good institutions are going to foster economic growth. Just to give you an example. So rule of laws, right? So this rule of laws is going to foster economic growth is because that's going to protect people's property. That's going to encourage people to invest, to innovate. And certainly these properties just include property rights, right? Property rights is part of rules laws, right? And people, when people do business, they need to follow the rule. So this rule is going to encourage you or give you incentive to do your best. Otherwise, if everything I produce, if everything I um, um, innovate, innovate, is going to be stealed by somebody else, I probably won't have much incentive to do to do those uh, hard work, right? All right. And also there are other factors, includes effective private sector, civil society groups, and a free press political competition. Okay. Um, here, one thing is less obvious, let's just say free press. And why free press uh, is important to economic growth, right? So free press, uh, in some sense, that's going to give the in, give the government some incentive to pers pursue uh, effective, pursue fair economic policy, right? Otherwise, without free press, the government and partic particularly those politicians, they can do what is best for their own interest instead of pursuing economic policy. That is that's going to serve the interests of the country or serve the interest of the economic growth. Okay? This free press, so give the population a channel to speak of, and this channel is going to give the government some incentive to follow the right policy. All right, so this is the third one. Now, again, so we can look at actual data. So this show you the relationship between governance or between institution and economic growth. So they create a governance scores. You can see this probably is similar to human development indexes. So they just look at different aspect of here. So the things we just look at, rule of laws, extent of corruption, property rights, and the quality of government bureaucracies and other measures, right? And then they create indexes. And then, so they use indexes to look at how these indexes correlated or may cause economic growth divergence, right? And then clearly you can see there is a strong positive correlation. Better governance score means higher real GDP growth. But yes, we saw some outliers. But in general, look at the broader spectrum. So there's a strong positive correlation. Again, so uh, uh, words of caution. So this correlation only tells you the correlation, but doesn't tell you the causality. All right. Now to summarize, uh, oh, sorry. So this is here. So we are in the, in the in institution governance how the good institution and governance affect growth, right? And here, so I cite a, another research, they list five institutions that are necessary for um, healthy growth, include market institutions that protect property rights. So that's giving people incentive to invest. Just give me a second, seems like this ink tools has some issues. Let me try again. Okay. So first, we so we need property rights. All right. So let me just restart my um, PowerPoint during the break. All right. So let me finish this slide, and then so we take a ten minutes break. Right. So so we need property rights. So this property rights is going to. Um, give you incentive to innovate. And secondly, we need uh, uh, institution that deal with 
market failure. What are examples of market failure? A good example of market failure is pollution. So pollution is caused by a particular natural of pollution, pollution itself, which is externality. So the market cannot address the uh, pollution problem itself, but certainly the pollution is going to undermine economic growth. Right? And then so we need good institutions or we need good governance to dealing with this market failure. Third, market stabilize the institution to control inflation. Because with stable inflation, so then so we have incentive to invest, we have incentive to build to business. Right? So we, that's linked to our earlier discussion. Fourth, market legitimize institutions such as social production and insurance. So this is very, very important, right? So let me just give you a particular example to understand why this is important, right? So think about a young college graduate student who is very passionate, who is very ambitious, who is very entrepreneurial, uh, who has a lot of entrepreneurship, right? So, and there's the image, this young man lives in, has a choice to live in two different societies. One, in the society, so if he pursue his dream, he think, think big and he take a lot of risk. And if he fail, so he has lots of social protection in, in, as a form of social insurance. Meaning if at the end, so if he fail completely, is still so he can get some support from the government through, say, for example, unemployment insurance benefit or through some agency help to him to find a job or relaunch his business. This is case number one. Now, in case number two, so if this young man live in a different country with very little social protection, in a sense, if he fail, so he is going to go to jail because he, he, he cannot declare bankruptcy. He must serve his say, the rest of his life to, uh, to accumulate sufficient amount of savings so that he can pay off whatever his investor has lost by investing in him. Now just think about in which country you're going to see more entrepreneur, the first one or the second one? Which one do you think? The first one. The first one, right? And why the first one? Because in the first one, so there is a production. There is some sense of safety so that you want to take the risk. So that explains so why we need a strong institutions to provide social production, right? But there's a cash, right? And someone may argue, actually, this happens. It happens if we look at international conversion. So there's a cash in the sense, okay, so if the social production becomes too strong, and then so people becomes bold. People, people becomes not cautious enough. They take too much risk. All right, okay, so we need to be careful um, on that aspect, All right? Okay, now go to the last one. Political institution determines how a country is governed, All right? So include a level of democracy, transparency, free press, so on and so forth. Right? So this is linked to earlier discussion I have. Those, um, those things, those aspects of the country, so in some sense, is going to monitoring or uh, providing incentive for the incumbent political parties or the administrations to do the right things. Right things in the sense is in the interest of the society instead of interest of certain selected group, right? So I'm going to um, stop here, and so we are going to take a ten, let's say ten minutes break. In the meantime, let me just restart my uh, PowerPoint, and then so we we come back uh, seven. Let's say we can number seven seven seventeen. Sounds good? Yep. Okay. Let me just restart. So I just restart my PowerPoint, not my entire machine, right? Thank you. <laughs>